um, let's get right into the matter. This is uh, for the Florida Bar. This is CLE approved. Now, you know, it's a little weird doing this webinar right now it, it, because right now, as we speak, Florence is making landfall on North Carolina. And, you know, it, weird may be not the right adjective, but I just don't want people to think that we're being opportunistic here. So we arranged for this webinar weeks ago with the Florida Bar Association before Florence was even a thing. Uh, September and October, as you probably know, are very busy hurricane months. Um, so uh, we felt that it was an important subject for us to, to cover, and here we are, and it's just kind of a coincidence that this major storm is hitting today. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Larry Port. I'm the CEO of Rocket Matter, uh, founder of this organization 10 years ago. Um, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm an animal lover. I have a lot of different roles in my life. Uh, I love coding. I don't get to code anymore. Now I'm a software executive. I'm an author. I wrote a book you're going to see in a second. Um, I coach Little League and I'm a member of the Anti-Defamation League. So I am a fighter of hate and I am a seeker of wellness. I just did a CLE yesterday about uh, attorneys and health and wellness. Big thing about me. And a lot of people don't know this. I am a pro at disasters and I've been through quite a few of them. So um I wrote a book for the ABA. This is it. It's the Lean Law Firm. Uh, my co-author, Dave, from South Carolina. I'm thinking about him today, uh, although he's pretty far inland, so he should be fine. Um, but, you know, uh, it, the, the book is really about kind of applying systems thinking to law firms. So um, it, there's, Lean comes from Toyota Production System, and it's a really clever way of managing your practice. Um, okay. If you want to read more, leanlawfirmbook.com. And then this is the product rocket matter uh, that maybe a lot of you on this webinar are using or thinking about using, um, but it's a cloud-based product. Um, actually, speaking of hurricanes, some of the first early adopters of rocket matter were the folks in New Orleans who had gone through uh, Katrina and were looking for a cloud solution for their law firm. So we had a lot of early adopters from New Orleans, um, mobile as well. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how rocket matter survived Irma. And before I go there, and Irma was the big hurricane that blew through here last year. Before I go there, I do want to point out um, that Irma was not my first rodeo, right? I have been through four hurricanes. Um, I've been through a terrorist attack. I was actually downtown on September 11th. I saw the second plane hit the Twin Towers. Um, that's a whole nother story. Um, I've been through two earthquakes, one in California, one in Chile. And I have... Um, not gone through a tornado, but I had a flat tire with a tornado approaching. So I consider that a tornado situation. Um, and, you know, I've learned a thing or two about these situations um, and and how to react and, and how to, you know, what is absolutely critical to like know in these situations. And uh, so unfortunately, um, I have a lot of expertise in the matter. So when it came to managing rocket matter and the Hurricane Irma situation last year, um, by the way, it was like in, in we had another hurricane the year before that was also very dangerous. It was like approaching uh, Hurricane, I think it was Hurricane Matthew, and it was a um, uh, it was headed right towards us before it cut north. Now Irma was also supposed to be a direct hit on our you know on Florida here, so it was very very disconcerting, and people were panicked because when it was headed right here, it was like a cat four, cat fives, which major hurricane. So what we decided to do, well, we, we, we tracked the storm, but we dispatched a team to go to the panhandle. Now, when we dis, uh, the, if you know what Florida looks like, the panhandle is up in the Gulf region, which is kind of approaching Alabama. And that might seem like a silly thing to do, but it seemed like the storm was not going to hit there. Um, we booked uh, an Airbnb or something like that up there and then the next day there was no availability anywhere like all the way up through north carolina uh, so one lesson that you might want to think about is that if you're thinking of evaluate you better have a place to stay or else you i don't know what you're going to do maybe stay at the fire station or, or whatever it is but um so so we dispatched five people that were cross-functional a couple people in support some engineers and some salespeople up to the panhandle area so that business could continue then the rest of the people kind of hunkered down in South Florida. Um, I operated remotely out of Georgia. And um, that's so, so we had this continuity plan where if like we, we figured that not 
all of our people down in South Florida were going to be affected by the storm because really it's the eye wall that can kind of knock you out. So we figured that some of our people might get affected, other people might not get affected. And between the people that weren't affected by a remote location and by me up in Georgia, that we were going to have enough redundancy that we could continue taking care of the thousands of law firms that we have on Rocket Matter. So in any case, um, as the storm approached, uh, I made sure like that, you know, kind of basically the day before landfall, I personally called every single employee and I just wanted them personally to hear my voice. I wanted them to hear kind of confidence coming from me. And I wanted them to feel assured that I had their back and that we would be watching out for them and their family, um, which I think is a very important thing for a boss to do, somebody running the organization to do in a situation like this. It, we have about, you know, 30 employees so it's not that unreasonable to do. If you have 100 employees, okay, that might be a different story. We'll talk about having phone trees and call trees later on to, to deal with that situation. But, you know, luckily, um, we were good. Uh, the storm went through, and one by one, people started coming online. Um, you know, we did lose power in our office, so our landlord hooked us up with a remote location that we could work out of. Um, luckily, the remote team up in Pensacola was unaffected. And there were a lot of people that were able to work from home. Uh, there were people that didn't have air conditioning and things like that. So they would come into the office if they needed to cool down or, or do some of that stuff. But um, we were up and running within a week. So, and this was uh, in the wake of releasing our uh, major update, our Atlas Gold release, which like affected all of our customer base. So it was a, it was a big thing. Um, so what I'm hoping here is to kind of give you some tips so that as you think about hurricane preparedness, you can be in as good as position as we were last year. And there were things that we weren't learned last year that we're going to take away with us as well. And I can kind of go into some of those things. Um, so here's something that's kind of interesting, which is a natural disaster occurs once a week in the United States, according to FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So that's a lot of disasters. Um, it feels like personally, I've been through all of them myself. So um, the thing is, is that most businesses are small businesses. Most law firms are small businesses too, and, and they don't have a disaster planned. And when they don't have a disaster plan and something bad happens to them, a lot of them just go belly up within five years uh, after a major disaster. So, you know, that's that's a kind of a jarring statistic to think that the lack of planning could result in you going out of business. But if you think about the implications of not planning, especially for a law firm, if your files aren't backed up or, you know, you don't have your stuff in the cloud and your paper files get destroyed, um, you know, your entire infrastructure getting destroyed, all the stuff that you invested in, if it's not insured properly or whatever, um, you know, you can see how it can cause major, major disruption and issues. Um, before we even go there, and I know we're talking about disasters in general, but I do want to talk about um, hurricanes in in particular, because uh, and this was a report that came out in the New York Times a couple of days ago that I felt was important to draw attention to, which is that a lot of people, um, a lot of meteorologists are very concerned about how the public reacts to the information that's distributed about storms, and they want to kind of change that information. Uh, the first thing is about the cone of uncertainty. And the cone of uncertainty, it, this one is for Tropical Storm Isaac. Um, this was taken from the 11 a.m. advisory. The advisories are every three hours. So, you know, there's always one at 8 a.m., 11 a.m., uh, I guess 2 p.m., 5 p.m., 8, 8 p.m., or so on and so forth. Um, so this one, the cone, you, you can see that it's tracking south of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and it looks like it uh, may be a tropical depression going into Cuba. But uh, what a lot of people don't understand about these things, and, and I would assume that a legal audience would understand these things, and forgive me if this is patronizing in any way, shape, or form, but people think that the cone is the size of the storm, whereas the cone is really just the probabilistic area where the eye of the storm will track through. And the eye is the really destructive part of the storm. I mean, the feeder bands and those other things are pretty bad too. Like when you see it from space, um, the whole thing looks nasty, but really the very nasty thing is uh, close to the eye. Um, I've gotten to go through an eye 
Uh, so like one, you know, I guess in Wilma or one of those storms, like in 04 or 05, we went outside of our house during the eye and we could see up and we could see the eye wall. It was pretty surreal. The other thing that people don't really understand is that it's not necessarily the winds so much that kill people. It's the storm surge that kills people. And that's why it's so important for the people near the coast to leave. Um, so, you know, that was what was so destructive about Sandy when you saw all the roller coasters out in the sea. Um, and that's why they're they're urging these people to get out of Dodge before the hurricane comes. I mean, obviously, you know, the wind is a major concern and things flying through their window and their roof peeling off. But, you know, when you have, you know, the, the way these things work is they're like snow plows. So these storms push water in front of them. And when you got 17 feet of water coming at your house, it's not a good situation to be in. So those are like two major things that meteorologists are concerned that people are not getting the full picture of when they see the storm. They see the cone and they think that that's the width of the storm and they see the category number and they think that's the only thing to worry about. Okay, so now let's get into the mechanics of dealing with hurricanes and other natural disasters. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, if you have any questions so far, please use your questions widget and write them in. I'm happy to answer them. And let's get started. All right. So the first piece of advice that I will give you, and this is not official advice, this is someone who's been there and done it advice, is that I, if you're in a hurricane zone and like we are, or even Houston, or you know all these areas, or even if you have some sort of precognition of disaster, any way of knowing that something bad is headed your way, never let your gas tank get below a three quarters full. And the reason that is, is because that once things pass, once the, the storm passes through, you may very well want to leave. Um, or once an earthquake or volcanic eruption or whatever happens, you may want to leave. Um, and you might want to travel two, three hours. And there's a good chance you may not be able to find any gasoline. You might want to leave because you might not have any ice, air conditioning, food, or things like that. And for example, it's very typical in South Florida for people to go to Orlando after a storm. So a lot of times the strategy is not so much to get out ahead of time, but it's to get out afterwards. And what happens preceding a major storm is that um, everybody goes to the gas station and it's not just people filling up their gas tank, they're filling up gas canisters because they have generators. So there's a huge demand on the gasoline supply. So it's very, if you think you're going to beat the crowd by waking up at 9 a.m. and going to the gas station, you're wrong. You, uh, I mean, these lines are, you, you can wait in line for hours and not get anything. So the best thing to do in the months of September and October, or even August, if you're in a zone, is to keep that gas tank never more than um, three quarters of the way empty or, you know, three quarters of the way full. I don't know what I'm saying here. Uh, you want it to be three quarters of the way full and, and don't let it drop down too much because you may need to get gas. And you might not be able to get it. Um, you have to weigh whether or not it makes sense to leave town for a few days. Um, does it make sense to leave town for the event? Does it make sense to leave town after the event? You know, if you got like, uh, if you got a nice bunker and you're pretty far inland, or if you're in a good safe situation, not near a flood zone or anything like that, then maybe it makes place, maybe it makes sense to stay, and maybe it makes sense to maybe leave after if you don't have electricity or things like that. But for business continuity, maybe it does make sense to leave. And like like it was the case with Rocket Matter last year, um, it made a lot of sense for me to direct traffic from Georgia and to have a backup team out in Pensacola as well. So you know, if you if you absolutely need business continuity, it makes sense to dispatch people remotely. And it's not always easy. You would think that it might be easy to send people out of harm's way and out of way of a hurricane, but people have obligations. They have families they have to take care of. They have pets they have to take care of. Um, so people don't necessarily want to leave. Um, but getting out of Dodge may be important. And certainly, if you're in an evacuation zone and they tell you to evacuate, you got to get out of there. Um, kind of like what we were mentioning uh, with what we did last year is to get some people out of the line of fire so that business can continue. Um, and you can incentivize this, right? So one way you can do this is that you can, if you don't have the funds or are unwilling to pay them a little bit extra, 
give them some additional time off. So if they volunteer to be the people that go to Tennessee and hunker down in Tennessee, then, you know, pay them uh, in vacation days. You say, okay, if you volunteer to do this, then you get two or three vacation days on top of what you already get. Um, so that's one way, that's a low cost way to incentivize people to get out of harm's way. The other thing that I would recommend is not driving. So this was one of the big takeaways uh, from last year. So South Florida is um, very isolated in the fact that you have to travel all the way up the Florida Peninsula to get into the mainland of the United States. Um, there's two major roads uh, going on the east side. You have the Turnpike and you have I-95. And then there's codes on the west coast. So everybody in Florida is looking through. And traffic was crazy. So a drive, you know, typically to go to Atlanta, which is maybe a nine or a 10 hour drive from here, was taking people 18 or 21 hours. And, you know, you got your kids, you got your dogs, you got all your stuff. It's it's not a good situation. And you, the last thing you want to do is get stuck on a road in with an oncoming storm. Uh, what I would recommend and what we are engaging on this time is for our, our employees that are going to uh, evacuate on our team. First of all, you have to identify who they are ahead of time, right? You don't want to wait until the storm's coming. So uh, we have a team of people that's cross-functional across our organization that we are going to dispatch to remote locations and we're going to fly them. So uh, we're looking at hub cities, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, which if Charlotte's under the gun with a uh, storm then which it is kind of right now although it is inland it's unlikely that south florida will also be so if south florida is under the gun most likely charlotte will be safe but we're looking at charlotte north carolina which is a major hub we look at atlanta and we're also looking at chicago as potential evacuation cities and all of these cities are uh have co-working spaces where you can like rent space for a little bit that has internet connectivity um you know telephony whatever it is you need for your employees to to hunker down there so um, that's one strategy for getting employees out of the way. Um, the other thing is that everybody should kind of be aware that you have an emergency plan. So you wanna make sure that you've formalized it, put it in a document, a checklist and review it once a year. And in the case of us, which it seems like we have an emergency every single year, um, you want to kind of evaluate the emergency plan and tweak it for any necessary changes. So after Irma, for example, we, we took a look and we tried to figure out if we needed to make any changes. So we, we toyed around with the idea of making my house a bunker and getting a satellite internet service and so on and so forth. We decided really not to do any of that major stuff. What we decided to do was that for the most part, it worked pretty well without any interruption to our customers. So, um, Instead, we, we think the only major tweak is instead of driving our remote staffs out uh, to getting them there. The other thing is that you're gonna wanna make sure that you have a communication plan. And if you can't call everybody personally, make sure that you have a call tree set up so that everybody knows who they're supposed to notify to pass information along to. Um, the other thing that's kind of critical is that you establish a check-in protocol after the event. So when the storm approaches, then um, you know that you have to check in once the storm is through and report in how you're doing. And you know we're always interested in how people's families are doing. So we wanna know about that too. So uh, we have a commu communication plan on, uh, we use Slack. Um, so people check in on Slack and they check in directly with their manager. And then usually what happens is a couple people will go will be without will, will they'll get their electricity or wiped out or their wi-fi or something like that so there'll be a couple people that we'll have to track down and we'll have communication about the people that we're not hearing from and then gradually reports will roll in oh i got a phone call from this person so on and so on so you need to make sure number one that you can have outbound communication but you also need to have a check-in uh, protocol after the storm or after the event passes. If you live in one of these zones where disaster can strike at any time, like an earthquake or a tornado, then you definitely need uh, to establish those things ahead of time. The, the thing about Florida is, is that it almost kind of forces you to develop these plans because you know, you have like a week to prepare. And, um, and, and so, you know, we've defined these things, but for those of you in these kind of sudden disaster areas, 
you're going to have to kind of take some time out to craft these when you're not under the gun of a hurricane. Okay, let's talk a little bit about safety. Are there any questions so far? Um, so I don't really have any questions rolling in. Um, I have a question for you guys, which is that if, if you have been through something, um, and you know, we've had, uh, when you have thousands of law firms across the United States, you see all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, you know, we had a lot of firms in Cedar Rapids. Cedar Rapids got flooded and that's like in the middle of Iowa. So who would have thought about that? Uh, we had firms in Alabama who were wiped out because of tornadoes. Um, you know, it's, it, when you look, there's all like, at, as we saw on our first slide, there's like a disaster every single week in the United States. Um, so, you know, we have had our fair share of issues uh, where we've had problems with clients. Okay. Stuck up on supplies. Uh, I'll tell you what I think is very important, having been through all this stuff myself. Right? Obviously, you need to get a good first aid kit. Now, what does a good first aid kit have in it? Well, uh, to be honest, you're going to want the, these kind of things. You want, um, a, you know, the kind of, and, and have one for your workplace and have one for your home and ideally for your car as well. That sounds maybe a little bit paranoid, but trust me you know, <laughs> take it from me, you're going to want these things. Um, <clears throat> it says here a compass. Okay, have a compass. You know, the picture has a compass in it. I don't know about the compass, but I will tell you this, you are going to want the typical bandages and gauze things. And we're going to talk about first aid training because you should be first aid trained. It's very good to have a battery powered radio, you know, and um, I don't like these battery powered TVs. They suck up like all sorts of energy. Um, you know, some of the radios are like wind up radios. Those are great. Um, but to be quite honest, like if it takes a, a, a couple of double A's and you have a whole big thing of double A's, make sure you have a whole big thing of double A's. You're going to want batteries. You're going to want your double A's. You're going to want your D batteries. You're going to want to have flashlights available uh, because power goes out a lot of times and you're going to need to be able to see at night. Um, candles, maybe. I'm not like a big fan of candles. They can cause more problems than they're worth. But the idea is that you're gonna need illumination. Some people get the uh, lanterns, camping lanterns, because you don't have to hold them. You can just set them on the ground and they can illuminate a room. Um, what tends to happen, and I forgot to mention, I was also part of the <laughs> power outage in New York City in 2003, I believe. And what happens in these situations is you just end up going to bed early. And uh, so you kind of like, kind of adopt like farmer's hours maybe, you kind of like, rise at the crack of dawn and you go to bed like you know earlier than normal um so but you are still going to need illumination things like that uh first aid supplies for sure um including like a tourniquet hopefully you hopefully will never have to use that but all the all the basic stuff you would want to have in a first aid kit aspirin aspirin is very important for pain relief but it's also important if people have like heart situations going on so having aspirin nearby is like very important as well um I can't believe I know all this stuff. I'm like hearing myself like talk about this and I'm like, I cannot believe I know all this information. Um, okay, we have a question. How does Rocket Matter back up the data that law firms entrust to it uh, when a storm knocks out power, internet, et cetera? First of all, can you guys hear me? Because uh, somebody reported in that they lost audio. So if you can hear me say, yes, I can hear you. Um, Okay, so for the person who lost audio, you probably cannot uh, hear me right now, but you need to log out and log back in. So the question is, uh, how does Rocket Matter back up, and thank you very much for letting me know that, how does Rocket Matter back up the data that law firms entrust to it when a storm knocks out power, internet, et cetera? Um, well, the, basically, we don't have the data here. Um, we don't have the data inside of like South Florida. It, you know, we have um, a redundant data facility in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, that also, and we also have geo redundant backups. So um, I looked at, actually, we've been in business for like 10 years. And, and back in the day, I looked at a data center in Miami. And this is like a Fort Knox. If you ever get a chance to look at a data center, go, go see it. I mean, this thing is, you know, the servers are 30 feet above sea level. Um, the walls outside are like, they're like 12 inches thick of reinforced concrete. Um, it is just something else. They have they have uh, backup generators that can run for two weeks. And but in spite of all of that, 
for some reason, I just felt, and, and also this place, that's where all of the internet traffic from South America and in the Caribbean kind of joined the rest of the internet traffic. It's called the, it used to be called the Nap of the Americas. It, and then I think it's, I'm not sure if it's still called the Terramark building, but I digress. The point is, is that I still didn't feel comfortable hosting there just because of the perception of having data in South Florida. Now, plenty of people and municipalities do, um, but where we host right now is the same kind of facility that governments and things like that host in. So, but in terms of our own, um, you know, facilities internal to Rocket Matter, we use mostly cloud-based software. Uh, there's very little that, like, I, I don't even know if we have a single server. The only servers that we would have in Rocket Matter itself are for like testing purposes inside the headquarters itself. So all we have to do is really pick up our laptop. Oh. If it doesn't, then um, I can revisit. Okay, I'm just looking through some more questions that we got in here. Okay, all right, let's continue. Set up an evacuation plan if necessary. Uh, so it's very helpful to know exactly where you're going to be and when. Um, so for example, like I was saying before, we knew where our uh, where our employees are going to go. We have like a primary, a secondary, and third city backup location. One thing I forgot to mention is that also when we buy these airplane tickets, we're going to buy them far out in advance, and we're going to buy travel insurance so that, or or we're going to buy the refundable tickets so that if we have to cancel them because of the unpredictability of these storms, we can do that and not lose all the money. Um, so setting up an evacuation plan is necessary um, if you want to make sure. You, you want to maybe make sure you know where you're going to be working too. So to that end, you might want to look up um, Regis or executive suite centers in the cities that you're going to. Maybe you have a colleague there. You can work out of their office or like a friend from law school or something like that or college. Um, and, but the other thing that you might want to take a look at are co-working spaces, things like what uh, WeWork offers. So those are places that you might want to go. Um, you are going to want to book hotel rooms in an evacuation sis, uh, situation sooner rather than later, especially if you're looking at driving radius. So if you're looking at driving radius, those hotels book up so fast. Um, it was uh, almost impossible to get hotel rooms uh, last year at the time frame we got them, and the next day it was impossible. And personally, what we did last year was my family, we booked an enormous house up in Georgia, because we knew that there were probably going to be other families down in South Florida that were going to run into trouble and want to evacuate and have nowhere to go. So we booked a house large enough to accommodate like 10 people. And sure enough, we ended up having uh, another family with us. So uh, that is, those are the most important things I would tell you. Um, evaluate, you know, what traffic conditions are historically like or likely to be um, if you choose to drive. And if you're going to choose to fly, make sure that you identify your target cities. Um, and your office, you know, in, in terms about in, in in terms of your office, you you probably want to take measures if you're going to shut it down for the day of the event. For those of you in you know tornado and in earthquake zones, you you don't have this luxury, but we do. So we have the luxury of knowing we're going to get walled by a hurricane. So in, in these situations, you just have to really just take common sense. You want to unplug stuff. You don't want to get, you don't want electronics getting fried in a surge. Uh, you also should move uh, valuable things such as computers and whatnot away from windows into an interior room. Um, likely no one is going to be working during a hurricane or a, such a situation. So um, you want to make sure that you lock down your office and, 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 and secure things. The other thing is that if you don't have stuff backed up that should be backed up, that's a pretty good time to make sure that it gets up into the cloud. So you take it to a remote location. Uh, this one, for those of us that are hurricane people, we know this one inside and out, that the safest place to be is away from the windows and interior room. Um, you know, I don't know what the latest stuff is for earthquakes because I haven't had to deal with them. I, if, if somebody's in an earthquake zone, that would be really helpful if you could like uh, mention that to us. Um, you know, if, if you could like let us know whether or not a, 
um, you're supposed to stand outside or inside or 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 in a door frame or or what you're supposed to do. Because truth be told, I really don't know what you're supposed to do in an earthquake. Um, <clears throat> but there's that's pretty much it. And to be quite honest, you don't really need to. I, I've I've ridden out maybe three hurricanes. I've found that you don't necessarily have to be in this location. Um, it's only when it gets really bad um, that you might want to get into a location where um, you know, you're covered. And the other thing they tell you to do that it, it is if you have to really seek shelter inside your own house, like things are getting real bad, is that you want to have a mattress on top of you. And that's because um, you want to shield yourself from any kind of flying debris. All right. Um, the one thing about these storms that always kind of makes me a little bit nervous is that I have a nagging suspicion that more people probably get injured before and after the storm than during the storm. Because before the storm, everybody's putting up, uh, you, you see it on the news, you see them putting up, uh, boarding up their windows, you see them putting uh, the aluminum shutters on top of their windows. The aluminum shutters are sharp, by the way, they could take your hand off. So, you know, and people are on ladders, so people are falling off of ladders, cutting themselves, doing all these horrible things. And then after the storm, uh, people get electrocuted or... Uh, you know, they the, like the things that get people are the hurricane proofing stuff and the hurricane response stuff. And and some people even with their generators, if you if you're running a generator, you got to make sure that that thing is ventilated. You cannot run a generator that's gas powered inside your house, or you will suffer from carbon monoxide poisoning and you can die. So people get killed from running generators inside their house when they think they're actually preventing, uh, you know, more misfortune than they would otherwise have. Um, likewise, outside after a storm, there is debris everywhere. It takes a while for stuff to get cleaned up. There are branches down, there are trees down. That's probably one of the most striking things after a hurricane is that how many trees are down. And the root structures, especially for some of the trees we have down here, the root structures, when these things tip over, they can be like 10 feet in the air. So they're powerful things, bringing down power lines. You step in a puddle that is uh, with a live current in it. It could not go very well for you. You know, don't touch wires, anything like that. You have to be extremely careful. And there's broken glass and, and debris everywhere. So you just have to be extremely careful going outside. Okay. Now, here's uh, kind of a vital skill I think everybody needs to know. And if you haven't done this, I would urge you after this webinar, or now if you're bored to go watch a YouTube video on this. You need to know how to change a flat tire. And here is why. I'm one of those guys that always relied on the AAA, uh, always. If ever anything happened to me on the side of the road, I didn't wanna have to bother with changing my flat tire. I'll wait the 40 minutes and have AAA show up. Okay, that's all fine and good. However, uh, the tornado experience that I had was like not such a positive situation. So. What was happening was is that I was going to a trade show. It was actually the Missouri Small and Solo Conference. Uh, and this was maybe eight years ago or something. And I was with Kim, who if you know Rock and Matter people, uh, the two of us were, uh, we had landed in St. Louis and Kim and I were trekking on out to Lake of the Ozarks for this trade show. So we're listening to the radio and every once in a while, they interrupt the broadcast and they start telling us that tornadoes are being spotted, like one, two, then three. Now, all of a sudden there's tornadoes everywhere and we don't know Missouri. And we're looking at our map and it seems like it, the, the towns that they're naming where the tornadoes are touching ground are starting kind of to converge all around where we are in our car. Then they stop the intermittent announcements. So between, you know, the classic rock, they'd say, okay, tornado warning. They stop all the music and they just start talking all about the tornadoes, all about the massive storms. They're like, get off the road, find shelter. You're an idiot if you're in a car driving across Missouri and you're from Florida. They're saying these kind of things on the radio. And there was no place to stop. We were in the middle of nowhere. We did not know what to do. And we're driving and driving and and so we start looking at, okay, should we pull off into these ditches? Like, what what do we do in this situation? Just as we're like having these thoughts and, and conversations, a tire blows out, a tire blows out. So we pull over to the side of the road, um, we hop out of the car, we take a look at the tire. The thing is in like pieces, not like one of these things where you could maybe like drive a little bit. And this was a rental car, right? I didn't know what to do. 
I mean, I was just staring at this thing thinking, all right, geez, if we call the AAA, are they going to be crazy enough to send somebody? It's going to be 40 minutes and then these tornadoes all over. So Kim says, pop the trunk. So she knows what to do. She's done this like a million times before. So, uh, you know, she kind of ends up bossing me around because I'm able to do it a little bit quicker. Um, uh, just I, even though I've never done it before, but you know, we got the jack out, we jacked up the car, we took the uh, nuts off and whatever. And actually, you're supposed to loosen those before the jack goes up. But let me tell you something: we were in a situation where if 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 I was not somebody with somebody who knew how to change a flat tire, I don't know what I would have done. So um, as silly as that sounds, like I've taught my children how to change flat tires, right? Uh, because I want them to know this skill. So if you've never done it, do it. Okay, the other thing that requires a bit more of a uh, time investment, by the way, learning to change a spare tire takes like all of 30 minutes. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things that's not a major time investment. Getting first aid certified, we just had nine people at the company last week get first aid certified. If you follow us on LinkedIn, you will have seen I took pictures of the little dummies. I thought they were adorable. Now, um, when you get first aid certified, here's what you go over. You go over CPR. You go over how to treat someone who has a heart attack, how to treat someone who's in shock, um, responding to burns, responding to cuts, choking, uh, strokes. And you learn it between the hours of like 9 a.m. to about 2.30 or 3 p.m. So it really is, you. it's a lot of information to absorb, but a lot of the information is like, okay, make sure the area is safe and call 911. And then there's some, but then you do learn how to treat like some of these situations. Um, we had nine people from the company do it because we wanted them to be like kind of spread all over the company in case a situation happens. And, um, and that's kind of, um, so I think it's, it's very worthwhile. It costs us $70 a person to get this training. And, and this is the kind of stuff that like, if you don't have it and you need it, you're going to feel like the biggest jackass for not having done it. Okay, we have uh, a question, and I am having some question uh, issues with my question widgets. So let's see if I can get to them. Okay, I am having trouble answering these questions. Let me see if I can somehow reboot my questions widget here. Okay, now we have a little bit of luck. Okay. How do you suggest preparing the office? For paper files, do you move them to interior office or send off-site? Do you require staff to clear their office of loose papers in case wind water intrusion, or is this a lower priority? Um, so the question, answer to that question is, is that in the case of a hurricane, um, you want to just, yeah, if it's loose paper, just have them put them in a desk drawer um, is what I would suggest. Um, and, um, you know, if you have like, uh, mission critical filing cabinets or so on and so forth, I would get them, if, if possible, get that stuff away from a window. Um, I don't think you want to risk major files or wills or critical legal documents getting destroyed. Ideally you're as paperless as possible, but in, in the case of certain law practices like wills and estates, um, you're going to have, uh, you know, paper that you're going to have to have. But if, if you don't have paper, learn from, take a page from the people that survived Katrina and ditch your paper and go paperless. I, I can't say it strongly enough. Um, and if your paper does get destroyed, it's kind of on you at this point. All right, let's see. Somebody said to change no to no on the flat tire side. Yes, they are right. That is not, that is not acceptable. Um, okay. Let's see, any other questions? I went through Katrina and one of the big problems was communication. The phone line were, were jammed for days, it was chaos. What can be done to facilitate communication with staff members and others during the event in, in the days that the days following? Um, if you're, by the way, one of the things is that if you're a Rocket Matter customer, you may or may not know that you have access to something called communicator in Rocket Matter. And communicator is kind of like Slack. It's an internal Slack-like tool where you can chat with everybody. So even if telephony is down, if you can get to internet connectivity somehow, you could log into your Rocket Matter account and, and communicate and send chat messages to each other from within inside of Rocket Matter. 
Um, if you're using Slack or something like that, we use Slack extensively during the hurricane. Um, so, you know, making sure that you have both telephony and internet based uh, communication uh, protocols is important in that instance. Okay. Oh, and we also had uh, a piece of information coming in from an estate planning attorney. They said that most estate attorneys do not retain paper copies of their clients' wills, according to the probate team conference, FLEA, last year. So that's good information. If you cannot, if, if there's any, if there's any, any uh, ability that you have to move paperless, take it. it, it is what I could say. It's just not only on a day-to-day -day basis is it so much more time efficient. I mean, and I use paper to take notes and stuff, but I'm talking about paper, like real paperwork product. Paper, uh, paperless is the way to go. Okay. Consider investing in a generator for your office and or home. So power loss is a big issue and it's probably the biggest issue at hurricanes. I'm very lucky. I never lose power for more than three days because my community is on the same grid as a fire station. So we usually get priority. Um, but there are people that are out po without power for like two weeks or longer. And that's just not a good situation because no power means not being able to charge your phone. It means um, your hot water heater may not work. It means no air conditioning for people in South Florida. That's a big deal. Um, now, if you do get a generator for your home, what I mentioned before is very, very important is that it cannot run inside of your house if it is gas powered. So if it is gas powered, it will produce carbon monoxide. And if, it, if carbon monoxide is in an enclosed space with a human, the human will die. So you can get carbon monoxide poison, poisoning very, very serious. It happens in Florida. You hear about it in the news. Um, here's something a lot of people don't know. You can get landline phones that don't have an answering machine. Actually, I want to be a little bit more specific on this. They have to be, they have to look like this. They have to have the little cord. Um, they can't be cordless phones and they can't be answering machine phones. They, there is voltage in the phone line. So if you have a phone like this and it's plugged into the phone socket or whatever, you know, the phone line thing, um, then you can still use it as long as the phone lines aren't damaged. If you have a phone that requires electricity, you can't use it. But because a small amount of voltage goes through the phone lines, one of these basic phones is a great thing to have. Now, the question is, do you even have phone service anymore? That's a whole nother story. But the, what happens with cell phones is this, is that not only does your cell phone have to have power, but the cell phone towers themselves have to have power. So if they don't have, uh, electricity serving them, you can't make a cell phone call. And then what happens is certain cell phone towers go down and other ones stay up. So all the load from the, surf, the cell phone tower that's down gets transferred to the cell phone tower that's still up. So then in that situation, the cell phone tower gets overloaded and you still can't make a call. So a lot of times with cell phones, it's very difficult to make phone calls during emergency situations. So having one of these in your back pocket and having a basic like landline plan, like $9 a month is, is a good situation to be in. Um, for your cell phone itself and other small devices, um, definitely have these things charged. These are, uh, you know, have a battery backup. These things are powerful. Um, and as you know, your phone probably drains before lunch. So if you're using a phone, you wanna make sure that it's on low power mode. And if you have an iPhone, you could just go to Siri and say, Siri, turn on low power mode and it'll turn it on. If you're using an Android, it's much easier. You just press a button at the top of the like screen to, to, to put it into low power mode. Um, but you're going to want to have these battery backup devices. If you went to a state bar convention, they probably gave you one of these, one of those little like cube size ones. So, um, you know, but you can buy ones that they, they hold a lot of power in them. Like you could maybe charge a phone five times with one charge. So they're very useful in these situations. By the way, some of the hand crank uh, portable radios have USB slots in them. I've never seen that be successful. And they also have solar powered cell phone chargers. So that might be something else you might wanna consider using. Oh, we have a question. Let's see what people are saying. Oh. Somebody's making a point that um, if you're on ATT Uverse, if, so 
So if you're not on a true tele like telephone system and you're on an internet ba based telephone system like Uverse um, or Comcast's telephone, I would think would probably also fall into this thing, then you may also be in trouble. Like you wanna make sure that you're using a true uh, old school telephone based system. Who provided your office's first aid training? Uh, our office's first aid training was provided by the American Red Cross. We called a local chapter. They sent somebody up from Miami and it was $72 a person. What are your thoughts on business interruption insurance? You know, I haven't really thought about that. Um, it's, it's not something that um, we've even contemplated because you know, we're so committed to maintaining our service up that I, I just never, it, and it's not like I'm a one man band here at Rocket Matter. We have so many people that we should be able to continue operating. So I've, I've never even thought of doing it. And, um, but I suppose it, it may be worth looking into if you're in a situation where um, you're kind of the only person operating a law firm and um, you're unable to do so, it might be something worth looking at. Okay. All right, the last thing is to get in the cloud. And I'm gonna try and wrap this up quickly. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the first early adopters of Rocket Matter people came from New Orleans. Um, they were Katrina survivors and they were looking for ways to securely back up their data. And because a lot of them just lost everything in, in the storm. Uh, if you keep all your stuff on-prem, uh, then any kind of natural disaster can knock you out, right? So you can get water damage as is depicted here. Um, in the case of our poor law firms in like Alabama during the tornadoes, they, there was like nothing left. Uh, so, you know, um, having access, to the, the, the nice thing about having the cloud is that you go to the nearest Starbucks that's still intact and working and you can access everything, right? So keeping your stuff on-prem leaves you pretty vulnerable. Um, you know, it'd be the same for us. Like if we, if we didn't just have like one place where our, our, our data was, you know, that would be crazy. You know, we need to have geo-redundant backups in case anything happened to us. So um, if, if stuff is in the cloud, then, and, it, and it's, let's, let's, let's caveat this thing. If, it's, it's, if you're using a responsible cloud provider, then you'll have access to the information on the cloud. If if the if if they're using modern data centers that are uh, you know certified and uh, that are high availability centers, which they should be using, then you should be able to go to just about anywhere with internet connectivity and have access to your documents, your cases, or anything like that. Um, so highly highly recommended. Um, the person who um, wrote in asking about what about like loose paper and so on and so forth. Hopefully that loose paper is a temporary situation and everything gets scanned and stored away. Um, but if you're using services like Rocket Matter, Dropbox, Box, um, OneDrive, the Microsoft product, Google Drive, then you know these are like big reliable companies that are handling your data in in responsible ways. So you'll be able to access them from anywhere. Um, Backing up your work is critical. You know, uh, if you are keeping a lot of stuff on a local computer, then you're going to make sure, you want to make sure that that stuff is backed up. And ideally your backups should be remote. So if, if you're using things that, that automatically back up, things like Google Drive or OneDrive or Dropbox or something, that's a good place to start. You know, you also, if, if you're not using those things to manage your files actively and you have more of a traditional file server, then I would invest in something such as CrashPlan or Mosey or Carbonite um, as standalone backup tools to automate the, back, the backing up of your documents. But you have to know, you, you have to be paying attention to make sure that those things are working because they're just like any other computer program. So the stuff that works in the background and is apparently like backing up your stuff um, you have to make sure and watch it to make sure that it didn't like stop somehow. Um, so that's very important. So you need to like periodically make sure that your backup stuff stopped. The other thing is that you need to make sure that you know, you feel comfortable restoring your backups. So in the case of Dropbox or, or Google Drive, or even if you're just using like, you know, Rocket Matter or any other cloud-based product, you're not really 
missing a beat because it all syncs automatically. But if you're backing things up to Carbonite or Mosey or Crash Plan, you have to understand what's involved in going to a new computer and fetching your backups off of those services. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, we kind of talked about this Dropbox, OneDrive Box, um, cloud based practice management such as Rocket Matter, um, and a straight up digital backup storage device. So, um, and the other thing is that uh, you, you do want to think about security in these situations. So security is something that is often like kind of thought of afterwards by a lot of people, uh, not by um, crazy computer science people like yourself, like myself, but um, you know, a lot of times it's just kind of bandaged on, but you kind of have to think about, for example, all the, th all the security holes that could happen in a situation such as a hurricane or other natural disaster, right? Like, are, are there vulnerabilities to you? Could people gain access to your offices in the event of a storm or gain access to your systems that are like left behind? So you really wanna make sure um, that you are securing all of your information uh, while this stuff is taking place. Because once it's out, it's not going back in, it's like toothpaste, right? So maintaining awareness of security computer security in this situation is important. If, for example, you go away and you turn your computers off for a while and you, you come back into your office and, you're, and, you, and you neglect to turn on your Windows update just because of the change in the routine and your Windows security updates are not applied, then you're vulnerable to a ransomware attack, right? So in I know it's a big ask, but I'm pleading to uh, I'm I'm pleading from the perspective of a computer science paranoid type person that you maintain your operating system updates uh, because that's where most bad stuff happens. Okay, um, I don't know if we have any more questions. There were a lot of good questions today, um, and I think. Um, what I'll do is I'm going to put the CLE number on the screen. It's 3143. So if you have any questions for me and you're shy to ask it on the webinar, I'm Larry at rocketmatter.com. Uh, we have great software uh, for managing practices and increasing your revenues if you haven't taken a look at Rocket Matter. Um, also, I want to plug my book, uh, leanlawfirmbook.com, that I wrote with the ABA. And um, I'm always, you know, we work with thousands of firms. I'm here in Florida. If you have questions about disasters and want to hear my crazy stories, or if you uh, have some yourself that you want to share, um, always happy to hear from people in the community. Don't be afraid to reach out to me. Uh, be careful if you do reach out to me. I do engage, so I will be communicating with you. All right. Thank you very much for your attention today and your time, and I look forward to hearing from you.